I cured my pink eye! Welcome back to another disturbing book review where we actually review disturbing books. So in my last review, I talked about The Playground by Aaron Beauregard. He is a splatterpunk author. He's written about a million books, but The Playground really went viral for just how taboo and offensive its content and subject matter was. Well, I got my hands on Aaron Beauregard's newest book, Through the Eyes of Desperation, and we're gonna be talking about it today. You don't have a choice. And look, I hear you. You're probably saying, look, Jules, this sounds like it's gonna be an okay book and all, but I don't know, does it even have any poop eating in it? You better fucking believe it. If you watched my review of The Playground, you probably remember just how dense and high concept and exposition packed that book was. It took me like 15 minutes just to explain like what the setting and, and like structure of the story was going to be. And for the record, that's not like a bad thing. Some of my favorite books are very dense and a high concept and high exposition. I'm just bringing this up to warn you that Through the Eyes of Desperation is even more high concept because Through the Eyes of Desperation contains one of my favorite ever literary devices, a gimmick. Actually, there's um, two main gimmicks baked into the very gluten that is Through the Eyes of Desperation. For one thing, this is not a standalone book. If you'll notice, it says the red version. That's because this book is Aaron Beauregard's collaboration with another splatterpunk author, Daniel J. Volpe. Daniel's version of the book has the same title, but it's called the black version. So there's like red and black, get it? So both Aaron and Daniel wrote books about the same setting, which is The Shadows Casino. So if you read both the red and black version, you'll be getting two completely different books, two different stories, four different endings. Oh, <laughs> did I say four different endings? I meant two endings. Two endings per book! That's right, baby, gimmick number two. Each of these books has two different endings, and you as the reader, once you get to the ending, have to literally flip a coin to find out which version you're getting. So just as fate and luck are affecting the characters in these books, fate and luck are also impacting your reading experience. I feel like the gimmick aspect of this, especially the ending, might put some people off. But me personally, I fucking love a good gimmick. I was raised on those fucking uh, Goosebumps, Reader Beware, You Choose the Scare interactive storybooks where like you would literally have to like flip to a certain page to continue to the story and get your ending. And so this is right up my alley. Not only do I like the gimmick itself, but I think it's done in a pretty clever way. But before we get to the endings, we need to start at the beginning. And before we get to the beginning, we need to go over the content warnings. So uh, just like last time, this is your one and only spoiler warning. I am going to be talking about uh, pretty much every element of this book so that I can like review it with context. And that includes talking about some of the endings. So if you want to read this book blind, stop watching now, go read the book yourself, and then come back and hear my correct opinion. Also, the trigger warnings. Again, this is the one and only time I'm going to warn you about the content of this book and the things I'm going to be talking about in this review. I am trusting you as viewers to be intelligent enough to know your own limits and know what you are okay and not okay with hearing about or reading about. Also, uh, someone in the last video told me that it would be more accessible to visually impaired people if I read the content warnings out loud, and so I'm going to be doing that now, partly to be accessible and partly because it's just funny. So, trigger warning for the following. Murder, torture, gore, rape, drugs, alcohol, addiction, gambling, sex work, sex trafficking, child trafficking, child abuse, child endangerment, death of a child, elder abuse, elder sexual abuse, racism, sodomy, sexual assault, dismemberment, self-harm, overdose, genital mutilation, vomit, coprophilia, or poop stuff, coprophagia, or even worse poop stuff, period blood, Piss, any and all bodily fluids, organized crime, the mafia, Italian people, <laughs> offensive Italian stereotypes. <laughs> Everyone got that? We all, we all understand what's gonna be in this video? Okay. Oh, and it should be noted this book is non-linear, 
That's right, baby, we're back. Hello, I'm future Julia. You will be seeing me periodically throughout this video because as usual, I did not in fact get all the footage I needed the first time I filmed, which was completely intentional to play into the non-linear elements of this story. On to the story itself. Okay, brace yourself. Uh, here, take my hand and hold on tight because I am about to run through the exposition of this story. Do you understand? We have a lot to get through and I want to get us to the actual book review. So we, you're gonna have to fucking keep up with me, okay? And later we're gonna slow down and actually go through the individual things in this book. But just for right now, you just have to, you just have to fucking run with me, okay? Just fucking run with me. So. Meet our protagonist, a man named Red. <laughs> Through a series of flashbacks, we learn that Red used to be a serious heroin addict, as opposed to a casual heroin addict. When he was in active addiction, he used to live with his girlfriend, Brittany, who she's a sex worker who is also addicted to heroin. They also had a daughter living with them named Desi. Although Red doesn't actually know if Desi is his biological daughter because you know, he genuinely loves her and treats her like his own. It's actually kind of sweet. But none of that matters because one day Red came home and discovered that Brittany had fucked off and took Desi with her. So womp womp. Red takes this devastating loss as a wake up call and he starts making moves to turn his life around. He moves back in with his ma, he goes to rehab, he gets sober, he gets a job. Things are looking up. Then one of Red's friends is like, Hey, me and some of the guys were planning to mark cards and cheat at gambling at this one local casino that is run by the mafia. You want in? And Red is like, yeah. <laughs> so that goes well for a while and they're actually making money until they get caught by the head of the mafia who's running this casino named Mad Dog. And as his name would suggest, he is none too pleased about what these guys have been up to. So Mad Dog has everyone in on this cheating thing killed, <laughs> except for Red. He decides that instead of killing Red, he is going to employ him against his will. <laughs> so at the point that the book begins, Red is working as the booking boy for all of Mad Dog's bets and gambles and whatnot. And you know, it's a terrible job, it sucks, but at least Red has learned a valuable lesson about cheating and he's never gonna do something like that again. Just kidding! Red starts fudging some of the numbers in the betting books so that he is taking out like small amounts of the profits and keeping them for himself. And he's using this money not just to support him and his mom, but also to pay a private investigator to try to find Brittany and find out where she took his daughter to. Anyway, surprise, surprise, Red fucks up and he gets caught sneaking money from Mad Dog and he's like, oh shit, I need to get my mom and skip town now. But when he gets to his mom's house, two of the mafia goons named Dane and Bugs are already there having tea with his mom. <laughs> Bugs pulls Red to the side and is like, listen, you stole like a million dollars or something from Mad Dog and you are going to pay it all back in insert time limit here or else Dane and I are going to do insert horrible things to your mother. Red is like, but that's impossible. How am I supposed to make that much money in such a short amount of time? And Bugs is like, mm, I think I know a place. And that's how we end up at Shadow's Casino, the actual setting for the most of the story. Yay, we did it. Um, actually, minor correction. The time limit is not as arbitrary as I thought it was at the time of recording this. At the very beginning with this conversation between Red and Bugs, Bugs does explicitly state you have four days to come up with this much money. Um, but it was just mentioned so briefly the first time I read it that I just, it went right over my head. And so, and so the whole time I was reading the book the first time, I was like, what's the big idea? He didn't even give us a time limit. How much fucking time do we have? So yeah, Shadow's Casino is, as you might've guessed, a casino except fucked up and evil. But in my twisted mind, it's just a normal casino. At Shadow's, it is possible to earn crazy amounts of money and you don't actually need money to play any of these games. But if you lose, then you'll be paying with your body parts. Bruh. Red sees uh, two things right when he walks into shadows that really like set the tone for his time there. One of them is this enormous glass display case exhibiting this full body skin that has been like 
peeled off of a human being. Uh oh, <laughs> wait a second, we've been here before. <laughs> so yeah, we don't know who yet, but someone definitely got skinned and they are now being used as a decoration. I think I've seen this film before. <laughs> And I did not like the ending. The other first thing that greets you when you walk in the door is the buffet. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a huge buffet, except instead of food, it's drugs. <laughs> it's every kind of drug you could ever imagine. Bath salts, weed, acid, shrooms, cocaine, absinthe, ibuprofen. <laughs> One of the drugs that is available at the buffet is spice which is problematic in its own right because we know that that was not ethically collected, you know? But also available at the buffet is heroin, which was Red's drug of choice. The whole time Red is there trying to focus on like what he has to do to make this money, he is fully aware that heroin is right within arm's reach of him. It's fucking free, it's right there. I really like the way that Aaron Beauregard wrote Red struggling with his addiction. I myself am not an addict, I don't have first-hand experience with it, but the writing does such a good job at emphasizing that like hunger that Red is feeling. Like he'll see a game and he thinks about trying to play it, but then he's like, oh, I'm so stressed, I can't focus. Maybe I could play if I could relax just a bit, you know? There were so many points where I was certain that Red was about to relapse. And every time he thinks about it, but then doesn't do it, it's not even a relief because we know that the drug is still there, you know? Okay, I need to, I need to be completely honest with you all. I need to bear my soul here. I respect my viewers enough to, to just tell the truth and admit my shortcomings. This is not going to be a full, complete review or at least as complete of a review as it could be because in short, I I have no idea what gambling is and I don't know how any of these games work. Most of this book is describing people playing these gambling games. I don't fully understand a good portion of this book. Like there's parts describing people playing these games and one of the players will flip over a card and it's like a four and everyone has this big reaction and I'm like, oh no, numbers. But I don't know how much that's actually gonna affect my review because all of the games at Shadows seem to have had their rules altered to be even more unfair. The biggest and most consistent difference with these games is really the penalty for losing one of them. For example, when Red gets to Shadows, the first game that he sees being played is Three Card Monty. Uh, you know, where it's like, there's three cards face down and one of them is a queen and the dealer mixes them up and then you have to guess which one is the queen. <laughs> well, in Shadows, it's the same concept, except instead of three cards face down, there are three maxi pads on a table and one of them is used. I think you know where this is going. Red watches this guy playing this game where he's trying to find where the used pad is and he guesses wrong and the dealer tells him that as a penalty for losing, he has 30 seconds to eat it. <laughs> and you better believe the guy does it and you better believe the whole process of him eating it is described in great detail. All of the games at Shadows are like this, where it's almost exactly like a regular game at a casino, but then there is some disgusting or violent, painful twist at the end. And it becomes clear pretty early on that the entire casino is built around these punishments. In fact, it seems that the goal of the people running Shadows isn't to make money, it's to dole out as much of these punishments as possible. Understandably, after seeing the guy lose with the three maxi pad Monty, Red is very hesitant to play any of these games, especially because the dealers just straight up won't tell you what the punishment for losing is. Everything is very cryptic at Shadows. Everyone speaks in riddles. But at the end of the day, Red is here to make money, so he's going to have to play one of these fucking games. Oh, one last rule. You can't leave Shadows Casino until you win at least one game. So yeah, once you're in, you're not allowed to have like a come to Jesus moment and be like, huh, I think gambling might be bad for me. No, you're like in it to win it. The first game he decides to play is craps and the dealer informs him 
This is one of the lowest stakes games you can play at Shadows. So as Red is about to like roll or whatever, I don't know how you play craps, he's about to roll fucking dice. There is this sexy lady who has been watching him for a while and she comes up and she gives him one of her chips and says, something about you seems lucky to me. Like, first of all, girl, you have no fucking idea how wrong you are. But this lady's name is Lily, and we are going to be hearing about her more later. So anyway, Red rolls snake eyes, which means he loses, I guess. And so as his punishment, the dealer opens this curtain, and there's this fucking, like, <laughs> dirty, scruffy, Neanderthal-looking man in the cage. His name is Ricky, by the way. We know his name. Ricky crawls out of the cage holding this bowl. He then poops in the bowl. The dealer takes the bowl and says to Red, all right, go ahead, eat it. Red's just like, what the fuck? This moment happens so abruptly. This is not my first rodeo with Aaron Beauregard, okay? I went into this book knowing that there was gonna be like gross poop stuff or eating gross things at some point. There is no possible way I could have like braced myself for this moment to happen out of nowhere. Anyway, you can imagine what happens next. Red has to eat the whole Ew. thing in great detail. The first game he plays. This is the first game he plays at the casino. So uh, after this point, Red kind of forms this friendship with Lily, the woman who was watching and gave him one of her chips. And like the whole time they're friends, she's just like inexplicably magnetized to him, you know? I find her statement of like, something about you seems lucky to me so funny. At first I thought that was just her like being dumb and having bad judgment, but it turns out there is something very special about Red. Um, what is it? I, I swear to God, it happens like five separate times in this book that Red has a brief interaction with someone, either a dealer or another uh, player at the casino. And after like exchanging a few sentences, they're like, I like you. You're not like the other scumbags who run this place. Like, bitch, how? <laughs> like every time one of these people says that about him, he, he, in my opinion, at least from my perspective, he's done nothing out of the ordinary at all to warrant that kind of reaction. It's like he's, <laughs> Red is the manic pixie dream girl of Shadow's Casino. He's like completely average and yet everyone just sees something like so different about him. I don't get it. Anyway, enough summarizing. Let's get into actually reviewing this book. Also, you're gonna have to bear with me. I'm going to be comparing this book to The Playground a lot. And that's for a few reasons. For one, I'm pretty new to Splatterpunk and these books are kind of my real entering into understanding the genre. And two, I like to compare an author's works to each other and try to find like patterns and motifs that run throughout different pieces, you know? I think it's a really good way to like get a feel for an author's strengths and weaknesses in their writing. I'm not gonna lie, going into this book, I was kind of expecting it to be very similar to The Playground. I just assumed that the way that The Playground was written was Aaron Beauregard's standard way of writing. Giving Aaron Beauregard credit where it's due, boy is not a one trick pony, okay? Through the Eyes of Desperation is, have I been holding it upside down? <laughs> Through the Eyes of Desperation really is its own book. It's nothing like The Playground. And the difference between these two books in some ways is really, really good. And in other places, it's not really my thing. Uh, one of the biggest differences between Playground and Eyes of Desperation, and I'm sorry to report this, is that Through the Eyes of Desperation does not have a Geraldine. I'm sorry, guys. Look, I'm, I'm just as disappointed as you are. For those of you who haven't watched my review of The Playground, in the book, The Playground, the big main villain is this old lady named Geraldine Borden. And she is so over the top evil and vile and despicable that she, whether intentionally or not, becomes fucking hilarious. <laughs> and I spent like 70% of that review just yapping about how cunty and slay she is. She consistently added comedic relief to an otherwise very bleak and miserable book. Through the Eyes of Desperation does not have a Geraldine. And that is a crying shame. I got, I'm taking two stars off my rating just for lack of cunt surf alone. No Geraldine really brings us to the biggest difference between these two books. And that is the tone and the experience overall of reading them. Through the Eyes of Desperation 
is like a slower, heavier, creepier experience than the playground. When I was reading the playground, it felt like getting shocked over and over again, you know, because everything about this book caused my jaw to drop. The the taboo subject matter, the, the violence against kids, the poop stuff, the Nazi character, the saw traps, just like, ah, 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 ah. Whereas Through the Eyes of Desperation is, <laughs> I never thought I'd say this about a splatterpunk book, but it is more of a slow burn. Like, of course, there are consistently gross and violent moments sprinkled throughout the book. But the thing that really got to me, more than the violence itself, was just the tension. Once Red enters Shadow's Casino, you are never allowed to forget what the stakes are. Like, right before he left, Bugs, that mafia goon, very explicitly said, like, if you don't get the money, I'm gonna, like, sexually violate your mother. And so, of course, Red can't stop thinking about that. He is so stressed, and then the stress just transferred to me, the reader, like through osmosis. To make matters even worse, uh, the arbitrary time limit is back. When Red gets to Shadow's Casino, they're like patting him down for weapons or whatever, and they take his watch off and they tell him like no time is allowed in the casino, which is actually a pretty clever way of referencing the way that casinos are designed to make you forget that time is passing, to make you not realize how long you've been in there. And so we know that there is this time limit ticking down before something awful happens, and yet throughout the book, we don't know if that time limit has already passed. It, it's like nerve wracking. And like I said, there's no real comic relief moments in this story. You're given this dreadful feeling in your gut and then you're just forced to sit with it. Huh. <sighs> By the time I was halfway through the book, I was like, oh my God, just get to the coin toss already. I'm like, fuck. One aspect that I didn't really like about the writing in this book was the pace and the organization. Comparing it to The Playground again, um, in that review I talked about how The Playground as a story is very structured and organized. Like you understand, the kids enter one room, one thing happens. They leave the room, they enter another room, one thing happens. They leave the room, they enter another room, one thing happens. Like it's very cleanly and clearly divided up and it also keeps the pace moving pretty quickly along. Aaron Beauregard is really at his best writing wise when there is some kind of structure to the insanity that he's writing about. There's a lot of different types of authors and a lot of different skills that authors have and I think that Aaron Beauregard is very much a content and ideas and creativity guy. I mean, like, have you seen this guy's fucking bookography? I don't know what the book equivalent of a filmography is or something, but bookography? Bro might be the Stephen King of Splatterpunk. He has written roughly one billion books over the course of his career. And between the last time I filmed and this time, just as I was editing, he announced that he has another book coming out this year. Bruh. Aaron Beauregard and his stories are so bursting with these ideas and these concepts and like there's just so much there and let's be clear I am not for one second saying like oh Aaron Beauregard needs to tone it down and stop trying to fit so much shit into his books quite the opposite I love that he does that I just think that he is at his best as a writer when he has some guidelines to keep all of these ideas and concepts together and moving forward through the eyes of desperation is not clearly organized. And that leads the, the writing and the story to feel a bit meandering. Additionally, Red doesn't play many of the games at Shadows. In fact, he spends most of his time watching other people playing the games and also like wandering around. While I was reading it the first time, I found myself um, kind of just like not being affected by the violence as much as I was in the playground. Like the things that Red is seeing are in no way tame or boring. Like these games are resulting in someone getting shot or being cut in half or being sodomized until they're bleeding. And of course that's horrifying, but at the end of the day, Red isn't directly impacted by the violence he is witnessing. Um, and I think that's really where my problem with this wandering part of the story comes from. I spent a lot of the book kind of frustrated and confused at our main character. Like, 
bitch, we need to make some money. Like, are you gonna do something or not? Because really, throughout his time at Shadows, Red doesn't fucking do a lot. And every chapter that passed with him not doing something, I was growing like increasingly agitated. And maybe that level of agitation was what the author was going for. Um, I certainly didn't like it though. That being said, logistically I understand why Red doesn't play many of the games at Shadows. Because the penalty for losing most of these games is like dying. So if Red was super interactive and playing a bunch of games, he would either die and then the book would be over, or he would have to win every single one of them, and then there would be no tension. Also, it's pretty understandable why he wouldn't want to play a game again after the first game he played resulted in him eating poop. Let's talk more about Lily, that lady that Red kind of becomes friends with. After Red gets done eating poop and the two of them kind of establish that like, okay, we can form an alliance together or whatnot, she leads Red to a place called the Dollhouse. The Dollhouse is this strip club slash brothel that's connected to Shadows where like players can, I don't know, do that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, by the way, Shadows has all kinds of stuff besides a casino, apparently. There's the Dollhouse, there's a theater where I guess they do shows every day. That's fucking fun. There's something called the Mystery Parlay, which we will get to later. Like, fuck, there's probably also a fucking karaoke booth somewhere in here which I would love. Lily is one of the sex workers at the dollhouse and I, I forget if it's explicitly stated, but it very much seems like she's imprisoned there. Like, I don't know if through paying off debts or sex trafficking or something, but she is definitely not there for fun, you know? So Red and Lily get a seat at the dollhouse and he pretty much tells her his entire life story about like his mom and Mad Dog and the mafia and the money and his dad and his addiction and the private investigator, how he wants to see his daughter again, you know? And Lily is very sympathetic towards him. She's very kind and understanding. And when he's done telling his life story, then he's like, so what's your story? And she goes, I'll, I'll, don't worry about it, I'll tell you later. <laughs> Bitch, what? <laughs> Lily is a very mysterious character, all in all. Like, I, I don't think we ever actually learn much about who she is, and it makes me wonder if in the Black version, we'll learn more about her. The whole time Red is bopping around Shadows, he has a bunch of, like, brief conversations with other players, and each of these players gives him not advice, but like stupid cryptic hints of advice. These people cannot communicate for shit. The main takeaway that we get from all these interactions boils down to don't play blackjack. Blackjack is the most dangerous game here. The slot machines are a pretty safe way to make money. And most importantly, above all, avoid the Black Widow. The Black Widow is this mysterious woman who is the current owner of Shadows. We never hear exactly what is so dangerous about her, but I mean, she's called the Black Widow, so I'm assuming she might have killed a person or two. Bruh. Lily is kind enough to give Red some more like cryptic half pieces of advice. And she also reiterates, stay away from the Black Widow because she's apparently a fucking monster. Sure enough, guess what happens next? Red encounters the Black Widow and Sure enough, because he is the Manic Pixie Dream Girl of Shadows Casino, she like weirdly singles him out of the crowd. And they have this very ominous tense interaction where she calls him out by name and says, how far are you willing to go? And he's like, fucking what? <laughs> what? How far are you willing to go to save Desi? And he's like, what? So after this like scary tense interaction, Red is like, <sighs> You know what would help me focus on my goals right now? Relapsing. <laughs> so, yep, that's it. He goes to the buffet and just fucks up some heroin right then and there. And this is probably one of my favorite depictions of a drug trip I've ever seen in, in literature. It honestly reminds me of the psychedelic portions of the book Fluids by Mae Leeds, where the drug trip itself is so like dizzying and kind of hard to read. He's been sober for years now and so this heroin just hits him like a truck and he's also mixing heroin and cocaine. It describes him like nodding off while also having heart palpitations and like falling asleep and getting back up and not knowing how much time has passed and like trying to walk and falling up. It, it's like kind of sickening to read. And while Red is tripping balls, an announcement comes over the loudspeaker that says like, hey everyone, there's a special magic show happening in the theater with our special guest as the assistant, Lily. 
Red is, of course, concerned and he's like, why is Lily in this magic show? This can't be anything good. And so he like still tripping and nodding off, goes to the theater and like falls into a seat. Red sees that Lily is in a wooden box thing and the magician is about to perform that like classic, I will now saw my lovely assistant in half trick. Except um, I don't know if you've picked up on the vibes going on here, but I have a feeling that something is going to go wrong during this magic trick. So Red is in the theater and he sees Lily is in danger and he's like, oh my God, L Lily's in danger, I have to do something. He nods off again from the heroine, this time waking up hours later to discover that sure enough, Lily got fucking cut in half and she's dead now. We're never gonna see her again. It is a bold move as an author to have your protagonist fucking fall asleep during a crucial plot moment like this, but I really like that Aaron Beauregard went there. Honestly, it's more realistic this way. Like, yeah, he just took fucking heroin. Let's talk about the Italian stuff. <laughs> a pretty major part of this book is the looming threat of the mafia run by Mad Dog. And Mad Dog is just another example of Aaron Beauregard being really good at writing compelling characters. For one thing, we hardly ever see Mad Dog. We only see him in person like one or two times, and the rest of the time we're getting messages delivered through his goons, Bugs and Dane. The fact that we don't see Mad Dog that much adds to this like kind of silent terror of him. The first time we see him is when... The first time we see him is in his factory. We'll talk about the factory in a second. Remember, Red got tied up in this like cheating scheme with a couple other people. Well, Mad Dog found out and brought all of the people involved into his factory and kills them one by one. The way that he is described is like genuinely intimidating and unnerving. Bugs and Dane come in and they like have Red and they're like, he is the guy boss. He's, you know, this older, big, tough mob boss guy. And the first observation that Red makes is that Mad Dog is drooling and he doesn't drool all the time. It's specifically said that he's drooling because in this moment confronting these like handful of people who were trying to steal some money from him, he is so angry at them that his jaw like clenched and can't close. And this is apparently where he gets the name Mad Dog from. And so the whole time he's talking, the whole time he's confronting these people, he's also like wiping his lip with his handkerchief over and over again because he's just dribbling. That is so interesting. That is such a cool and unique way of showing like what kind of person Mad Dog is, you know? If I'm remembering correctly, I don't think Mad Dog in this whole interaction raises his voice once. And Mad Dog himself says like, this is not about the money, it's about the disrespect of you cheating in my casino. I really like how it establishes that Mad Dog is not just a violent person, you know? He's not dangerous just because like he'll shoot someone. He's like, there's something fucking wrong with him. I just wanted to mention how much I like that characterization and how I really do think Aaron Beauregard is very fucking talented at writing distinctive and interesting characters. However, <laughs> how do I put this? <laughs> I, I don't know how it is in other countries, but at least in the United States where Aaron Beauregard is from and where I am from, like when we think of organized crime, the first place our mind usually goes to is the mafia. And more specifically, the Italian mafia. I mean, there's countless movies and shows about it. it it's just a cultural fascination over here. And so I don't think it's ever outright said but it's very heavily implied that um, Mad Dog and I think also Bugs and Dane are Italian Americans. <laughs> okay, I have never been the type to be like, oh, this is racism against white people. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe this other than this is possibly the most offensive stereotypical representation of Italian people I have ever seen. <laughs> My biggest reason for saying this is because remember that factory that Mad Dog has? The place where he's like, you know, kills people? Um, it's a 
tomato sauce factory. <laughs> it's established Mad Dog runs this very successful family owned tomato sauce business <laughs> to the point that Red's mom at one point is like, oh, they're my favorite. I love their bolognese. <laughs> Red gets dragged into this tomato sauce factory run by the mafia. <laughs> All the other people who were involved in this cheating thing were already there. They're tied up to chairs and all of them are gagged with a tomato in their mouth with tape over it. And so Mad Dog confronts them and he's like, you have all fucked with the wrong one and there is no forgiving that. You're all gonna pay for this. So naturally he's gonna have his goons kill them one by one. And each of them, I, I kid you not, I'm, <laughs> I'm begging you. I'm begging you to believe me that I'm telling the truth. This was actually in the book. All three of these people are killed in tomato based ways. <laughs> so one of them, the one who was marking the cards that they were using to cheat, um, they cut all her fingers off because they're like, oh, you use these fingers to cheat at my games, whatever. But they cut her fingers off with like these big ass shears, like the kind that you use to cut tomato vines. <laughs> And then the next guy, they crush him to death, but they crush him to death in this industrial sized tomato press. <laughs> they, put, they put his ass in there and they just squish him. And finally, the last guy, who it turns out is Mad Dog's nephew or something. What the fuck? Like, if you knew your uncle was this scary, why the fuck would you like try to get one over on him? Well, first of all, he puts a knife in this guy's spine paralyzing him, like from the legs down. Oh, but before he puts a knife in, he's he has this quip where he's like, like, I can't believe my own family stabbed me in the back. So I'm gonna show you getting stabbed in the back. So yeah, anyway, bro is paralyzed from the legs down. But of course, that is not tomato based enough of a murder. In order to actually kill him, they throw him into a boiling vat of tomato sauce. <laughs> they cooked this bitch. They made him bolognese. So like, do you see where I'm coming from? What I'm saying, like, this is a kind of fucked up <laughs> representation of Italian people. Where like, oh my God, I'm crying. So yeah, the obviously Italian coded characters in this book are mobsters who run gambling circuits and also own a tomato sauce business where they cook people who fuck with them and put their meat into the tomato sauce. That's another part of it. I just like, I mean, I'm not Italian myself, but I, I do have Italian friends. And so I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with this kind of representation, you know? Hello, future Julia again. So I do a lot of kind of bitching about Red as a character and as a person throughout this video, but for the sake of being fair, I want to go over a few reasons why I think Red was actually a really good choice for the protagonist of this story. He's sympathetic enough that I found myself genuinely wanting him to succeed. And he's also dumb enough <laughs> to make enough bad decisions that keep the story going, you know? And I can't talk about Red as a character without talking about his mom. Aww. His mother and his relationship to her are like vital to this story. Red's main motivation throughout the book is, I mean, one, finding Desi, but more pressingly, it's his mother and her well-being. Like we learned that after Brittany left with Desi, Red's mom is the whole reason that he was able to start turning his life around. Like she took him in, she got him into rehab, she got him a job, she like didn't for a second hesitate on like wanting to save her baby boy. We get this kind of generalized understanding of Red and his family dynamic. We know that Red's father was also involved in like organized crime and kind of like gambling, gang life, whatever. And it resulted in him getting killed. And so we know that Red's mother, like she's not just trying to help Red succeed because the, of a mother's love. She has this kind of like compulsive obsession with Red's well-being. I really like that. A lot of stories use the overprotective mother trope and I think this one does it very well. We're not around the mom enough for this overbearingness to get like annoying, but we hear about it enough to know that like this is a core part of her identity and value system. I really like that there's this like tension in their relationship going both ways where she desperately wants to make sure 
that he doesn't end up like his dad and he desperately wants to make sure she doesn't find out that he already has. So as I said before, this book I think suffered from a little bit of a lack of organization which resulted in it being a bit meandering and I, <laughs> I will admit, as we neared the climax of the story, I started to get a little cocky. <laughs> I kind of found myself thinking like, I guess old man Aaron must have lost his touch because I haven't even found myself wanting to throw up and die once while reading this book. <laughs> I guess I'm just so desensitized that dark twisted content doesn't even bother me anymore. I'm 15 years old and I watch lively gore videos for fun. I'm better than all the cheerleaders at my school. <laughs> um, have any of you ever heard the definition of the word hubris? <laughs> so through a series of unfortunate events, Red actually plays a game. He plays blackjack and shockingly, he actually fucking manages to win. Woohoo! <laughs> so after winning, Red has this conversation with the dealer. And of course, first the dealer has to comment on how he's, wait, no, let me quote exactly. The dealer leaned in close to Red. I don't do this for everyone, she said, but there's something about you. <laughs> Might just be that awful stain on your face. Oh, by the way, he has a birthmark. I didn't fucking mention that. The dealer basically gives him the advice that the only way he's gonna make that much money that fast is by playing the mystery parlay. So at this point, Red is like, I mean, fuck, Lily's dead. I've relapsed. We have nothing else to lose. Let's do the fucking mystery parlay. It's very much the climax of the story as far as like intensity and violence and Red's desperation and determination as a character. This part has everything that I really like about Aaron Beauregard's writing, and it has the stuff that I've been missing from the book up until this point. For example, we have more organization, yay! And we have the structure and rules of the parlay explicitly laid out and explained for us. That like automatically made it a lot better. So Red walks into the mystery parlay and he is greeted by a screen he watches a video that was recorded by the original founder of Shadows Casino, who Red notes looks familiar somehow. Hmm, I wonder why. His name is Gianni, by the way, so more Italian representation. And the video is basically the founder being like, hello, guy. <laughs> Welcome to the mystery parlay. Here's how the game works. We learn that the mystery parlay is made up of these three separate games, and each of them are incredibly unfair and incredibly dangerous, and you have to win slash survive all three in order to move on to your big winnings. So stage one has Red in this room with a gigantic like wheel of fortunes type wheel that has to spin. The wheel is divided up into 25 spaces and each space that it can land on has some absolutely skin crawlingly horrible dare on it. All of them except one. Exactly one of the spaces is green and it says, move on to stage two. As you probably guessed, Red has to spin the wheel and whatever horrible challenge it lands on, that's the one he has to do. And the only way to escape the room and move on to stage two of the parlay is if the wheel lands on the square that says move on to stage two. So possibly you could get lucky and spin the wheel once and it lands on move to stage two. Or possibly you could spin the wheel 10 times and every time you do it lands on like cut off a finger. Here are just some of the challenges that are on the wheel. Rupture your eardrum with a nail. Light your hair on fire. Fish hook in pee hole and reel. Bite off an entire fingernail. Saw off your arm. Run a razor through all your toe webbings. Chug a jug of garbage water. <laughs> Eat a dollhouse mini. Aborted fetus. What the fuck is this, a crossover episode? Okay. I know it's a little silly to be complaining about this game being unfair, but can we just talk about how some of these dares are so obviously easier than others? Like some of these will just obviously kill you immediately and others are just like kind of gross and uncomfortable. Like one of them is eat a pail of rat poison pellets. Bitch! And then another one is like drink garbage juice. <laughs> like, okay, gross, I guess. Oh, also each one of these challenges has a time limit. This time we get a visible timer to tell us how long he has to complete it though. So little treat for us. Red spins the wheel and it immediately lands on bite off a fingernail, which like, geez, that, aw shucks. So he manages to do that and he spins the wheel again and it lands on fish hook in your pee hole and reel. Ooh. And Red does it and it describes 
every single uh, second of the process. And this just goes on and on and on. And red is just not landing on the move to the next stage square. Of course, this part like sucked to read and had me gagging again. But I kind of am disappointed that the rest of the book didn't have this level of intensity and like skin crawling moments, you know? I'm kind of bummed that it was all saved until the very end. Anyway, finally, after uh, stabbing himself in the dick and eating a plate of foot fungus and cutting his own finger off and shooting himself in the foot and drinking the garbage juice, <laughs> yes, he landed on that one. He finally lands on move to the next stage. And I'm just gonna be honest here, parlay number two was just not that interesting to me and it was pretty quick, so I'm just gonna skip over it and go right to the good stuff. So Red walks into parlay three, the door locks behind him and he's greeted by big theatrical curtains. The curtains dramatically draw back to reveal a racetrack and the screen lights up, here's Gianni again. He delivers, in my opinion, the most skin crawling line in the whole fucking book. While dog tracks may be a dwindling form of gambling across the country, here at Shadows, the tradition remains alive and well. There are no protesters to fret over our rules. There are no lawsuits in the underground. I would even go so far as to say we've enhanced the races. Another curtain is pulled on the racetrack to reveal four cages. And in the cages, there aren't race dogs. There are four children with bags over their heads. Why are there always children, Aaron? Why do you keep bringing the kids into this? There's two boys and two girls in these cages. Like one of them is wearing Scooby-Doo underwear and one of them is wearing like Rugrats pajamas and oh. But guys, don't worry, okay? It gets worse. Red is informed that each of these kids has a marking on their heads under the bag. One boy and one girl have red, one boy and one girl have black. So yeah, the way this works is red is gonna choose either red or black and then like the colors on the kids are gonna be revealed, their race is gonna begin and whichever kid makes it across the finish line first, whatever color they have on their face, uh, that's the winning color. So it, it kind of is a 50-50 chance. Or at least that's how I thought the game was gonna go because then red is presented with a shotgun and four different types of bullets. One is a bird shot, one is a buck shot, one is a slug, and one is a blank. So the rules are Red has to fire all four of these bullets at whichever kid he chooses. I guess the idea is kind of like, if you pick black, you can better your odds by killing and injuring the kids who are like red, you know? But they all have bags on their heads, so we don't even know which one is which. And of course, not shooting them is not an option. I mean, why would it be? Are you stupid? But wait, there's still fucking more. As Red is like panicking, like trying to figure out what the fuck he's gonna do, he hears behind him, I asked you before how far you'd be willing to go. And he turns around, it's the fucking Black Widow. So yeah, Red gets a very brief conversation with her where he's like, please don't make me kill these kids. <laughs> and she's like, you have to, think about Desi. And I guess that was the right thing to say because immediately then Red is like, you know, you're right, I can kill these kids. <laughs> but instead of like shooting one bullet at each kid, he decides his best odds, since he doesn't know who's red and who's black, are to shoot all four bullets at one kid. This is truly Aaron Beauregard at his evilest. It describes how Red, just without even looking, picks one kid and fires four times. It, it, even though it happens so fast, everything moves in slow motion. And it describes each different shot, each different kind of bullet as it landed, as it made impact. Like how the first bullet was the bird shot. And so the kid was hit with all these tiny pellets on her legs. And the second shot was the buck shot. When it hit her, it just like wiped the skin off her shoulder. And it, oh, finally, fucking finally, the like last shot kills the kid and immediately they pull the bags what? off the other three kids' heads and they're just like, all right, let the race begin. So bam, the kids are off, red bedded on red and spoilers, a black one. <sighs> this whole part has just been like sickening. One's awful skin crawling thing after another, but easily the most sickening part then is that red starts like screaming at the kids. Like when the little girl who's the black queen 
crosses the finish line. He's reacting the way that a gambler would react if they, you know, lost money at a racetrack. Except instead of a horse or a dog, this is a starving human child that he's screaming like, are you fucked it all up at? Immediately after screaming, like Red realizes that he hasn't just lost the chance to save his mom and the chance to save Desi and all this money and everything else. He's lost his humanity. Like he's a monster now. He just killed a kid and he collapses and breaks down in tears as two bodyguards pull him out into another room. But the room he's brought into is not like an executioner's chamber, it's the office of the Black Widow. And okay, I've put off mentioning this about the Black Widow up until this point, but I guess I should bring it up. Um, MILF ALERT! Okay, uh, we can move on now. Even though I do still think it's a bit silly that like he's like the chosen one of the Shadows Casino and everyone like sees something so different in him. This is the one time that it actually kind of makes sense why the Black Widow sees him as like kind of stand out amongst the crowd. She listened to Red's whole life story and knows that the whole reason why he's in so much debt is because he was paying this private investigator to find his daughter, Desi, because he doesn't know what happened to her. And this fact alone means enough to the Black Widow that she took an interest in him because she says, I would have killed to have a dad like you who would spend money and risk things to save me. And like, she doesn't go into any more detail. We don't know, we don't love, buy the black version to learn more, you know? So yeah, she was like kind of rooting for him. She wanted him to succeed to save Desi, but then she brings up that she also saw him in the theater when Lily was being cut in half and he was so high that he just fell asleep and didn't do anything to save her. And she says, so what is it? Are you the father that I would have killed for? Or are you just another druggy piece of shit? <laughs> Which, um, actually, Miss Black Widow, that seems a little fucking unfair. <laughs> like, completely putting aside the kind of demonization of people who struggle with addiction, um, you put free drugs in the casino and then you're like mad at people for being high. So she says, let's find out which one you are. Then she pulls out a poker chip, which is red on one side and black on the other. And she says, call it. I'm gonna flip this poker chip. And if you pick the right color, I'll give you like a billion dollars and you get to go home free to save your family. If you pick the wrong color, then let's just say, that won't be very fun for you. <laughs> so this is it, the big gimmick ending. The chapter ends with the Black Widow flipping the poker chip into the air and it is followed by a message to the reader telling you now is your time to participate. You have to get a coin, decide, you know, uh, heads is red, tails is black, and then you flip the coin yourself. And whichever side or color it lands on, that's the ending you get. Okay, get ready to call me a little baby bitch. I love that. I, I don't, why would that make me a baby bitch? I think this is a fun gimmick and I think the execution of it was like really well done because you know, you are flipping a coin at the same time a character is flipping a coin. You in this moment are just as helpless as Red is. And I think that's really cool. I really like that. So as a lot of people predicted, one of the endings is kind of a good ending and one of the endings is kind of a bad ending. I'm not gonna tell you which ending is which, if it's the black or the red, but um, let's just say I got the fucking bad ending the first time I flipped the coin and I was pissed. <laughs> so let's start with the bad ending since that's the one I fucking got. So yeah, red picks the wrong color, is accosted by the Black Widow's bodyguards, and then it cuts to his mom's house where we see Bugs and Dane are still right there. They have been chilling in her house for the past three and a half days and they are getting antsy. Side note uh, about Bugs and Dane, they are pretty small characters, you know, like they, a lot of the book isn't dedicated to them, but in the bad ending, we find out, oh my God, if they were bigger characters, they would absolutely be the Geraldine of this story because these two are like kind of funny as fuck. Like, the time limit finally runs out and they're like giddy to start torturing Red's mom. They're like terrifying. And oh my God, torture her, they do indeed. This is like the most gruesome part of the whole book. And it lasts for like the entirety of the bad ending is just describing these two adult men 
beating the shit out of this elderly woman. And oh my God, it goes on and on. But in the midst of all of this, we also learn this like kind of cute detail about Bugs. Cause like Bugs' whole thing is that he has a baseball bat and he made explicit threats about hurting Red's mom with a baseball bat. And as he's preparing to start hurting her with a baseball bat, he's like monologuing at her. And he's like, you know, I always wanted to be a baseball star when I was a kid and starts just talking about that. <laughs> and so like similarly to how um, those cheaters were killed in like tomato themed ways, this whole torture sequence is baseball themed. <laughs> it's like so out of left field, it's great. <laughs> Which leads us to my other favorite detail of this, this, this ending, the bad ending, is Bugs and Dane's relationship. Which again, we haven't seen any of this up until this point in the book, it hasn't been relevant. But now it's like these two random tertiary characters are getting center stage and we learn so much about them and it's so fucking funny. So yeah, Bugs is getting ready to like baseball torture this old lady and he's like, hey, you got any regulation balls? You better believe Dame pulls a regulation ball out of his coat because he knows Bugs so well and knows this is the kind of ball he likes to torture people with. What the fuck? So the scene just goes on and on and it's so brutal. Like these two men are literally like beating the shit out of this elderly woman. At one point it mentions Bugs like stomping on her chest and you like hear her ribs crack. It's stomach churning. And the whole time these two assholes are bantering. <laughs> I kid you not. I need you to believe me when I say at one point during this torture scene, Bugs stops what he was doing and the two of them have an interaction like this. Yeah, yeah take uh, that, die, old lady, die. Uh, take that, old lady. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of glad Brett didn't come back with the money. Me too. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, there'll always be more chances to make money, you know? Like, we'll always be able to get more money. But a moment like this, that the two of us get to share together, that's priceless. But then it gets even worse or better because remember Bugs made a very specific like threat to sexually violate Red's mom? Well, she dies mid-torture before he gets the chance to do that to her. And so they like get into a fight. The book literally describes it as they fight like an old married couple and that's exactly what it sounds like. It's like, well, she's dead! She is? Yes, she is, you fucking idiot! You, Sorry. You took too long, you always fucking do this! Okay, it's- just relax. No, don't tell me to fucking relax. I, I didn't get the chance to do that sex thing, the sex violence that I wanted to do with the yeah, bat. I mean, her being dead, that doesn't stop anything. You can still do it. Uh, go, do it. Uh, no, I don't want to now. Are you serious? Fucking idiot. Don't worry, though. By the end of the chapter, the two of them make up and they successfully desecrate Red's mom's body. So, yay! Finally, after we learn the fate of Red's mom, we learn Red's fate. Instead of killing him, the Black Widow has given him a fate worse than death. He is now one of the employees in the Shadows Casino, imprisoned against his will. Just like how he was employed by Mad Dog against his will. It describes that just like when he first entered the casino, Red doesn't know how much time has passed. He doesn't know how many weeks, months, or years he has been trapped in this hell. And he'll never know what happened to his mom, and he'll never know what happened to Desi. And grossly of all, they, they keep giving him just enough heroin to keep him addicted but never enough to like actually feel good or like let him overdose and die. So that's a bummer. Anyway, on to the good ending. In the good ending, sure enough, Red picked the right color in the coin toss and the Black Widow is like, well, now you get to go home free and you have a gazillion dollars. We again get a very brief, but very fascinating conversation with the Black Widow. And she, just like Mad Dog, is another example of Aaron Beauregard being really good at writing compelling characters. Red uses this opportunity to ask like, why, why are you using kids in the racetrack? Why are you doing that to them? And the Black Widow is just like, what do you mean? And Red is like, well, they're kids. Like I get putting adults through bad things, but like they're literally children. And the Black Widow just responds, why should their age protect them? It didn't protect me. Like, again, we barely know anything about her. We barely get a moment with her. But just from what we do know, we see that like she is someone who has been hurt in the past. And so because she's been hurt, she doesn't see anything wrong with like hurting other people. It's so like 
Ugh. Like everyone's been talking about her throughout this whole book as like, oh, she's a monster. You don't want to be near her. And we finally are hearing her philosophy and it's like, oh, you kind of are a monster, huh? Um, And so even though she's the one in complete control, she continues implementing the same horrible child torturing elements that the past owner did. Honestly, this conversation alone is what made me decide like, I do want to read the black version because the black version apparently is like more of her origin story. And I gotta fucking know what her problem is. So anyway, the rest of the good ending is kind of just a victory lap. It's it's so weird how fast things happen. Like he um, wins the coin toss, he wins his bajillion dollars, he gets to leave, he makes it home in time to save his mom, he kills Bugs and Dane, he shows up at Bugs and Dane's joint funeral to light the place up and single-handedly take out the entire mafia, including Mad Dog. He like literally brings a rocket launcher <laughs> and cherry on top, he finally gets uh, the private investigator to tell him where Brittany, his ex, is. So he hunts this place down and he walks in on her pegging a guy? <sighs> okay. We get like an unnecessarily long description of her pegging this guy. And it's like, Red busts in to confront Brittany to save his daughter once and for all. His Brittany is like, in the act and she's like uh yeah you like that you little bitch you like it when i oh my god where is my daughter so britney doesn't tell him anything but the guy who she was pegging does and he reveals this gut punch of information that britney sold desi a while ago and red is so driven and locked in that this information doesn't even phase him. He's just like, who? Who did she sell her to? Tell me now. <laughs> the peg E is like, a, a cobbler. She sold her to a cobbler. What? A cobbler? At no point in this book, at zero points up until now, did the act of shoe making and repair come up. And now we're finding out that like the missing piece of the puzzle. The answer to the question that has driven Red this whole time is some fucking cobbler we've never met before. I, I wanted to reread the whole book just to see if there was like this secret cobbler character or reference to a cobbler that I missed. But luckily, I didn't fucking have to. There is an afterwards to this book. Like after the story is done, right at the very end where it's promoting the black version, it says, to learn more about the cobbler, read So Sorry by Aaron Beauregard and Daniel J. Bull. These bitches have a cinematic universe. So this, <laughs> so yeah, in order to find out what truly happened to Desi or who this cobbler truly is, you have to buy another Aaron Beauregard, Daniel J. Bolt book. Uh, am I gonna do it? Probably, I'm fucking stupid. <laughs> and am I gonna review it? Probably, I'm fucking stupid. <laughs> Hello, I'm from the future. I thought everyone might like a little update. They got me. They fucking got me. So yeah, um, that's the end. <laughs> Those are both the endings. So, would I recommend this book? As usual, it really depends. If you can handle all the trigger warnings, if you can handle a very different kind of splatterpunk story and its structure and pacing and whatnot, if you can tolerate rampant anti-Italian microaggressions. And if you're ready to be very uncomfortable and on the edge of your seat, then yes, by all means, you should read this book. Just in my opinion, I think I prefer The Playground over Through the Eyes of Desperation. It, it's kind of silly that I keep comparing these two books because these are two out of the 500 other books Aaron Beauregard has written. And it's not that Through the Eyes of Desperation has like bad writing or anything. It's just a little observation. I'm just, I, I do a little observing, you know? Oh wait, one last other thing about this afterwards section. Um, In the last chapter of The Good Ending, uh, Red at one point calls Brittany a skunt, Bruh. says you fucking skunt, Bruh. and if you're anything like me, I assumed that that was, a, that was a typo, and he meant to just say cunt. Um, no, actually, we learn from the afterwards that the use of the word skunt was entirely intentional, and Aaron Beauregard then includes the definition of this word that he made up, uh, which is a combination of scumbag and cunt. 
So it basically means cunt. Yeah. <laughs> like there's better ways that you could have communicated that it wasn't a typo, you know? Like me personally, if I was trying to like uh, pitch a new slur, like invent a new mean word you can say, you can like have multiple characters say it throughout the book. So then it's like, oh, okay, I guess this is like in this universe, it's a common thing that people say. Instead of just throwing it in there once, and knowing that it's so out of place that people will assume that it's a typo. I don't know, I'm just throwing things out there. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. What a fucking mess. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe if you want to, don't if you don't. I'll see you next whenever I upload. And thank you so much for watching. Bye.